Have you ever been around somebody who you just look at and go, how do you do everything you do every day? Well, maybe Christian and I have got partners like that. We look at them and go, how do you do it? These people that tend to just make everything happen on their own. Well, we're going to talk to a special guest today that does exactly that across the globe. How about that? You thought you're an overachiever. Let's get into that. Stick around. Yes, welcome back to Chaps Many Cultures, where too much culture, too much culture is barely enough for me and Never this enough. bloke beside us. Now, of course, um, don't forget, we're going to just ask you, as we always do, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And now we've got our wonderful podcast. Of course, we always say that if you don't like looking at us, you can bear listening to us. Yes, do that. <laughs> put, the, put the headphones on. And let us uh, lull you to sleep with our dulcet tones, if that's what makes you tick. Well, but uh, subscribe to both, and or all of them, and share it with your friends. Click on that bell. Today, we are going to talk to somebody who is an absolute star, rock star, known in the field as an absolute rock star when it comes to doing things as a one person operation this uh, th this sense as i said in the intro these people around us that tend to do a lot on their on their own and make a lot of things happen and at the same time make a lot of people feel really great we are absolutely honored to welcome the wonderful addy johnson to the two chaps many culture stage Let the welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> oh it's so good to see you both thank you so much boy that's a quite the introduction <laughs> i'm so glad to be here thank you so much for having me well, it's, a, it's an honor to have you, Addy, and thank you for joining us. I know we, we took a, a couple of chances to get this done. And we also, I, you know, I'm going to, full disclosure, I've known Addy a lot. And before we went live here, she reminded me of how long we've known each other. And, uh, and um, you know, it only shows on your face, though, Brett. I don't know. Yeah, we yeah, haven't aged at all. I'm not sure how no. that math works. No, no, that's right. Uh, but it, you know, to me, who's somebody who knows you and uh, and absolutely has the deepest respect and uh, and love for what you do and how you make people feel. Tell us a little bit about Addie Johnson and uh, <laughs> and how you got to where you are right now. <laughs> sure. Well, again, I'm so happy to be here. And Brett, that feeling is very mutual with working with you for many years and you as well, Christian, um, through our work here at Aperion. Uh, in terms of my background, I am uh, originally from Southern California. I'm American, as you can hear through my accent. I was really fortunate to grow up in a diverse community and diverse high school. I was able to spend a lot of time in community services through volunteer work, my first couple of jobs. And that led me to Boston University, where I went for undergrad. I was really interested initially in psychology, but realized pretty quickly I did not want to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but boy, I like history. So that transitioned into studying international relations. Uh, and I shared with Christian, I absolutely fell in love with the German language early on. And I know, took advantage of the opportunity to go to Dresden, Germany for study abroad. Uh, while I was there, I made every single mistake in the book humanly possible for an American in Germany. I uh, had the best of times, had the worst of times, and everything in between. I came back to school and was taking a class, an international business class, studying organizations that had set up businesses in new countries and failed, one of which was Walmart in Germany. I think I visited one of the last Walmarts that was open <laughs> before they closed. <laughs> and understanding the importance of culture, that these companies did not take that into account when opening and operating their businesses. So that same semester, I saw an internship flyer come through from a company at that time, Eaton Consulting Group, which is now folded into a period, um, about a company that was actually helping people go through these transitions, but it didn't actually have to be so hard. 
to live, work, and thrive in another culture and how to help organizations take that culture into account and actually be successful. Hmm. So I joined the company coming up on 18 years this fall as an intern, uh, sourcing subject matter experts from around the world to join our programs and share what it's actually like to live and work in another country. So through that experience, sourcing and interviewing and really getting to pick people's brains about why things are different, how that's showing up in their lives and in their work, realizing some of those functions are actually HR functions, the interviewing, the recruiting, the relationship building, the life cycle of working with at that time contractors over 18 years evolved <laughs> into my current role uh, now as a chief people officer, as a department of one, technically in the human resource function. And that's where I am today. I, I want to dive right into this because this is a distinction that I've heard you talk about before. There's articles with interviews with you trying to clarify the terminology. Mm. So you're a chief people officer. And you said that's somewhat of an HR function, but would you agree that the terminology is interchangeable or would you insist on chief people officer? And if so, why? Oh, thanks, Christian. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we very intentionally as an organization did shift this department into people operations. And we started to see that shift at other organizations in the last five, six years in particular. And that's in large part because of the use of technology that has allowed us to automate so many of the more traditional HR administration processes. So people operations takes, uh, it's got a larger umbrella underneath that is the HR administration, the legal compliance, where that's a whole field of expertise for folks. And you also have talent acquisition, which is another set of disciplines under that umbrella. And people operations takes, it kind of includes both of those functions, but the focus really is on the people part and developing the people. So with the use of technology and really great partners, um, I'm able to be in that people operations space, not just on talent acquisition and not just on human resources. So. Instead of being in a more reactive, you're proactive, uh, you're really able to be in more of a strategic place and working with senior leadership and focusing on the overall people operations, not just the HR functions or just the talent acquisition portion. Thanks for that right. clarification. No, Brett said you're a, what was the term you used? One <laughs> person, one person people. So you're a department of one in a, small mid-sized enterprise um how do you have a seat at the table how do you have a voice that justifies the c in your job acronym the chief are you do you feel like you are having that leverage within the leadership team mm, i do and as to why i think there's a few reasons for that i think one really speaks to a parian as an organization, you know, what we do, it's focused on people. It's focused mm -hmm. on how we can understand ourselves better, understand others and what we can do to actually bridge those boundaries. And that's work that we do, of course, for our clients, but it's work that we have to do internally with each other because we are smaller, because we're so globally diverse. So to have um, a people focused individual on the executive team, is absolutely critical to what we do as an organization and how we will be successful in this space. Our people are our number one resource. They're our, our, our heart. Uh, it's why we do what we do. So I have full support from our management team and executive team uh, to have the, the people, the human-centered approach that we have. And for those who don't know Aperion, used to be a Perrin Global and you mentioned uh, the, the previous iteration of the, the company, but the company today and its evolution. Tell us a little bit about, about the company and its founders. Of course, Christian and I have partnered with a Perrin and have the good, uh, the good fortune to do so. You probably know a lot of the story, but for those who don't, um, tell us a little bit about a Perrin itself. Sure. 
Uh, we are coming up upon our 35 year anniversary next year, which is really exciting. Uh, the industry and the field itself, as you both know, has evolved so much over the last three, four decades. Uh, we were started you know, by our founders, Ted and Ernie, on understanding and seeing the need to better understand differences between uh, Japan and the US. That's where our foundations were. How can we support organizations uh, to understand themselves better and understand the markets and the people that they were working with to be successful? There was always this deep connection to, again, understand yourselves, understanding others. And what do you actually do with that knowledge? How do you actually bridge those gaps and, and those boundaries? Uh, that is still true today. <laughs> that still is the work that we're doing today. Obviously, so much has evolved. Uh, back in the 90s, it was VHS tapes being filmed by uh, our founders at the local airport. Uh, whereas today, it's obviously more of a global reach through our platform, through training and consulting as well. So the modalities and how we work with our clients has evolved. But the absolute heart and mission of what we do, again, that human-centered approach, has always stayed the same. We work a lot with customers who would classify as an SME, as a small or mid-sized enterprise, where their organizational structures might be similar to that of a Parian, where your role is a one-person department or maybe a two or three-person department where they have to be jacks or jills of all trades in, in, in that department or have good external partners to help them fulfill these functions. And I've also read about Aparian, and I think it was in, a, in an interview you gave, was it on Forbes or Fortune? I forget which, which platform it was on. And we'll, we'll make sure to post that link to that interview in the, in the show notes. Um, you said since, since Aparian is a training company at heart, all of the employees go through the training, right? Which is, a, a, I think, a fantastic approach because you eat your own cooking. Now, how... Go, going from your 18 years of experience of, of doing what you do in a, in a, in a mid-sized organization, what would you advise um, people in your role in companies that are not training companies who manufacture something, who provide a service, who have some other market solution that makes them a very successful enterprise in their field? Mm. What, what is the advice you would give people officers in, in those adjacent fields or, or mm. our client companies? Mm. I think the importance of having really amazing partners. I'm technically a department of one on the org chart, but in reality, there's so many folks that I rely heavily on. And of course, our line managers, our other management team members, uh, HR functions and finance functions, we're best friends. <laughs> so I work with so many critical partners inside my own organization that I could not do what I do without them and their support and encouragement, but external partners are so important. Uh, having a good understanding of their values and if they align with your own. A great example uh, for one of our partners is Bamboo HR. They're a human resource information system. Their mission is to set people free to do good work. Get the administrative stuff out of your way so you can actually focus on people. Yes, when I talked to their first representative, I thought, wait, but that's what I want to do. That's that's what that's exactly what gets me excited about my job. Like help people do their best work. So to partner with a company that has the similar values is so important. And they take really great care of their employees as well. Every single person you come into contact with is excited to help their team. They have excellent reviews online. They have great benefits for their employees. So finding a partner with shared values is important and happy employees engage. Think about historically, I've, I've always thought as a business owner, I've always thought if we can get rid of friction mm. and maybe what you're referring to in terms of administration, that can be friction. That can be getting in the way of people being set free as the bamboo, mm -hmm. bamboo folks say. However, you know, I, recently I was talking to an executive and, and she said to me, actually, the friction, some friction is necessary because if, if there was too much kind of openness and, and everybody was fitted together, 
there'd be no challenging of ideas. There'd be no creativity. There'd be no, you know, innovation. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that, Addy, as a professional who's worked with so many people from all around the globe, different identities, different backgrounds, different languages, all of these kind of things? Well, I mean, there's probably no secret sauce to it, but <laughs> do you find, you know, when do you think the too much friction is enough or too much friction is, or maybe you need a little bit more of kind of challenging ideas? So maybe it's a difficult question to answer, but I, you know, I'm interested in that. Yeah, I, you, I'm so glad that you, you identified that, Brett, because the healthy friction that 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 window where you're just outside your comfort zone, but you still feel safe, that's where you're where, where you're growing, right? That's where the yeah. growth is coming. That's where you have an opportunity to check in on yourself. What am I learning? Where am I at? Where can I go? And you just don't tend to get that sort of self-reflection or challenge if you're constantly in that that safe zone. So that just that there's a, it's a thin strip before you go <laughs> too far and then you don't feel safe to take that risk. So cool. to be able to have an atmosphere and a culture that is safe, psychological safety obviously is a really important topic i'm so glad that's something that's spoken about more openly now at organizations how can you create channels and avenues for folks to raise some friction to address some friction that's there in a way that feels safe for them and for others especially as you called out brett when you have folks that are in different parts of the world you have different work styles and cultural preferences how you even address the friction and the conflict is going to be very different. So having you know, like different modalities, whether it's through one-on-one, -on -one, it's close relationships, having um, a close partnership or ally in the workplace that, that can advocate for you, or general public forums where folks can raise questions. So having different ways for folks to lean into that friction in a way that's safe for them uh, is really healthy. Now, before we get to that point where we ask ourselves in within a team, whether it is safe or not safe to venture into the friction zone where we learn something new, uh, before we get to that, there is the process of bringing people together as teams. So you are also, or you did that for a long, long time recruiting, you bring people into teams. So is there something, and, and I know what my answer is to this, so I'm a bit <laughs> facetious about this. So, the we've heard a lot and read about for years about the cultural fit right mm. in hiring do we hire for fit do we hire for skill do we hire for both is there some in your experience is there such a thing as hiring for fit or is that a myth mm. i feel like the idea of of cultural fit was really growing probably about a decade, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And that was the first time where you were hiring folks, not the first time, I'm sure folks were certainly ahead of their time span the industry, that you were looking not just what's on a resume and what skills they had, but what, um, what really would make them successful at your organization. So you're starting to look at more what could be considered soft skills, uh, how they will communicate, how they will work with others, can they exhibit the behaviors that will allow them to be successful at the organization? So when it first came out, cultural fit, I think was really exciting, the big advancement in the field. But as the conversation has shifted and where we've all become much more evolved in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, the idea that you have this perfect model, cookie cutter, cultural fit, a candidate has to fit into this box that's them fitting in with the organization is actually really limiting, right? And it's leading, or it can lead to you frankly hiring people just like you and just the way you act and think and behave. So it's a bit of a semantic shift, but the idea that you should be looking for cultural ad, right? So folks that can contribute to your organization's culture, that can challenge you in a healthy way, encourage you to grow, inspire, uh, that's what you're looking for. So more of the ad than. But for a recruiter, that is that can be a very strategic approach, then, right? Because you have to assess what element would add to what we currently have. We need to fill a position, or we're growing and we're adding people for certain roles. Mm -hmm. And if you're in charge of recruiting, or if you're part of the.
Now, I saw my great colleague smile a little bit when you said the word soft skills. Uh -huh. well, two, words. two words, right? Let's uh -huh. call that two words or yeah. hyphenated. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes it's a grimace when he hears that I know that. So I want to call, I, I, I want to kind of bring that into the conversation. This definition of soft skills, it, which, mm -hmm. you know, for, for me and, I guess, and Christian definitely to taught me this, it, it really defines something that may be not as important. Mm -hmm. But so how do you refocus that terminology in? Because what you're talking about there are critical skills. They're important yep. skills. They're things mm -hmm. that can make or break an organization or the way that organizations work together. So how do you reframe that for people that are coming into an organization and, and make sure that they're aware that these people skills are important? Yes, I'm so glad that you caught that. And thank you, Christian, too, for the nonverbal cue. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Yes. To Exactly it. I, I think, again, the idea of culture and how that ties into soft skills, they haven't been a priority. They never were before, right? You're looking at hard skills. What's on a resume? What software do you know? What technically can you do? And you're right, Brett, like it is critical now. And that's what has me really excited for how the people operations space uh, has evolved, it really is seeing these skills, skills that used to be soft as critical. You have to be able to collaborate with folks with different work styles. You have to be able to communicate effectively with folks in different regions, functions. They're no longer nice to haves. They're absolutely critical. So what I'm seeing now, both internally in terms of, of course, recruitment and talent, but also externally with our clients, they see that as critical now too. You know, it's much more easy. It's easier now to learn a hard skill. There are a lot of free resources out there. There's a lot of really great um, ways to further your education and the advances of technology re can really help us in that space. So focusing on how to get those critical skills, what you know as soft skills, absolutely have to be a big focus for organizations uh, moving forward to develop their talent, re their talent uh, uh their talent resources, their, their people, uh, you have to have the focus on these critical skills because exactly that, they're critical. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's helpful seeing that uh, reflected in organizations' priorities now too. Now, you've been in the game long enough to have experienced the up and down cycles in the industry or on the client side for services that companies like Aperion or, or our companies provide. Um, I've, I'm just experiencing this with one of my long-term clients that they're going through a, a downward turn and they're letting people go that would be my points of contact, our access points into the organization, whether it be in people organization uh, function or learning and development or w however you want to classify those, those um, organizational niches. And it appears that these quote unquote softer functions have become less important on an operational level when it is all about meeting the margin goals and, and getting the bottom line straightened out. Mm -hmm. So in, in your experience, how have you been dealing with and how has your organization been dealing with these cyclical, cyclical uh, developments in well in the need for our services yeah uh, that is a, an age-old challenge right within this industry and that is a challenge that hasn't gone away and probably will not because you're right when it comes down between looking at your budgets and like well i either need to cut a software that my team needs to get their jobs done or i'm going to need to reduce my training and development budget those are real options that, that clients need to look at, and it makes it really, really challenging. Uh, for us, we've been fortunate to have really great champions and partners within our organizations that do have that same view that we do, that these are critical skills. And you can have fantastic software and hard skills, but if you're not able to collaborate, you're not able to communicate, you're not able to have a workplace that fosters inclusion and innovation, you're limited. You're only going to get so far. So it is playing a little bit into the long game, not just short, let's make the next six months of profit. But 
I need my workforce to continue to grow so that we can continue to be successful. Having close partnerships within these organizations that understand that is really helpful, but it is a real challenge. I, if that was an easier fix, boy, I'd love that. <laughs> Let me know if you find one. Uh, yeah. That is a real challenge. Well, one of the, I, I guess the thing, the unique thing about Aperion, and I, I guess one of the reasons I've always uh, been very loyal and, and respectful of the, the founders and folks in the organization like you, and I know Christian is too, is that you have, if we're going to talk about technology, is a tool that's proprietary to Aperion. And I guess that's the difference, right? It, when you've got something like GlobeSmart, which is a, an, on, an online tool that people can use and on a daily basis, but everybody that comes out of the organization and the people that work and partner with Aperion, like Christian and I, get to use that every day. We use it as a, it's the, in our DNA. It's the very essence of what uh, we teach. And maybe that is a bit of a help for Aperion. That's what's made it survive over 35 years of uh, this success. Um, layered, of course, or supported by the wonderful founders, uh, Ted and Ernie, and, um, and folks like you, Addy, that have made this uh, organization tick. Um, we just want to thank you for coming along and uh, sharing your knowledge and your insights. And uh, here's to another 18 years of... Uh, <laughs> what, <only? laughs> Why are you laughing so much? This is, you know, like... <laughs> blink, blink twice if you're okay. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for having me. It was great to have this chat. It was good to see you both. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'll leave you to sign it off, mate. What do you What do you got to say? Anything to add? Well, I'm going to say, first of all, again, thank you, Addy, for taking time. And I hope you all listen, those of you who are in the people business. There are no secret sauces. There are best practices, lessons learned. And yes, there might be times when... It's challenging to do the work that we do. In the end, it's not the company who is or does something. It's the people within the company that make the stuff, that do the things, that let the company grow or succeed. And let's take care of our people. Absolutely. Well said, Two Chaps, Many Cultures. Don't forget again, subscribe, listen, do whatever you need to do to uh, put us in front of you every day. Uh, apologies every day. in advance of that. <laughs> but uh, this is Two Chaps, Many Cultures. Again, where too much culture is barely enough and we'll look forward to seeing you on our next episode next week. All the best. Thanks, Addy. Ciao Thanks. for now. <laughs>